One year on from seizing control of Afghanistan, the Taliban rule with a rod of iron. Afghanistan now suffers under one of the most repressive regimes in the world. We lost everything. We don't have hopes, we don't have dreams. This is an Islamist police state which has stripped women of their most basic human rights. Who are you? Who are you? That is the image of what they want the women of Afghanistan to be wearing every day. It is a country where schools for girls are forbidden, and those who defy the ban live in fear of beatings and imprisonment. How scared are you? I'm terrified that they'll come and find us. Now I've come back to Kabul to meet the women who refuse to be silenced as they fight for their right to exist. For us, is the question between life and death. Either we are going to die or we are going to live. I've never been to this country when there hasn't been guys with guns everywhere. They're just different guys with guns now. Every time I come to Afghanistan, I'm excited at coming, but there's also a really heavy feeling of dread. I was in the country the weeks before the Taliban seized power. The West had abandoned its 20-year commitment to rebuild Afghanistan and left millions to their fate. Thousands of people descended on the airport, desperate to flee the Taliban. And it was in the midst of this chaos and the countdown leading up to it that I was approached by dozens of Afghan women pleading for help. One of those was Brishna, who I found hiding in the outskirts of Kabul. Brishna was one of the foremost advocates for women's rights in Afghanistan, and for that she was being hunted by the Taliban. Her position was so serious, we reached out to the authorities on her behalf, who recognized that her life was under threat. You have been authorized for evacuation to the United Kingdom by the British military. Escaping the Taliban wasn't easy, and for weeks she was forced to hide in a series of safe houses operated by a network of extremely courageous women. Eventually, Brishna made it out. Today, she lives safely with her family in Nottingham. Hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> when we caught up again, it's clear that her relief at being safe is mixed with the guilt so common with survivors, the guilt at leaving so many behind. I'm always worried about them. I can't even sleep. Is there any message you want me to give when I go back to Afghanistan? If you could just go and meet them, see them and hear them and be the voice for them. I'll try. <laughs> wow. Brishna. Brishna's greatest fear, and mine, is that the women of Afghanistan are in danger of being forgotten. And that's why I've come back, to find out what's happening to those who've been left behind. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
My arrival coincides with the first anniversary celebrations of the Taliban's victory over the world's greatest superpower. Calm down, calm down. Calm down, I'm trying to get your opinion. All around me, the streets are packed with revelers, and there's not a woman in sight. I see it's only men, and that's troubling to people in the, in the West, that there's no women out here. We should not join uh, women with uh, men, because Islam uh, don't uh, allow to the... Uh, the mixing to, to, to of to men the, and women. Yeah, uh, women. It's obvious that there are men in this crowd who hate me and everything I stand for, and working here is going to be tricky. The thing that you notice, particularly in Kabul, is that the Taliban are everywhere. They're a very pervasive presence, a very intimidating presence, and they're keeping a close eye and a strict control over what's allowed and what's not allowed. Slipping away from the celebrations, I'm off to visit somewhere that once embodied the hopes and aspirations of a whole generation of women. Only a year ago, this building had been at the center of Afghanistan's powerful new feminist movement. Not anymore. I'm told this writing says Afghan women won't be silenced anymore. And the whole of this building with its murals used to be the Department for Women's Affairs, which was shut down as soon as the Taliban came to power. This big image of this woman demanding her freedom with the words saying brave just above, above her has now been obscured by this big black smudge over her mouth signifying that they've now been utterly silenced. Yeah. Irony upon irony, I'm now being silenced. Says it's not allowed to take the video of this. This is my speech. Why? So, so now we're being, I think we're being summoned to see this guy's boss because we're not allowed to, um, to film and we're being told that we need to see the person who's in, who presumably is in charge of silencing women. I'm going to be treated differently because I'm a foreigner, but this is what it's like for a woman in Afghanistan now. You can't even complain about not having a voice. And for those who do fight back, the punishment is severe. This footage of a peaceful protest by women demanding the most basic human rights was filmed a few days before we arrived. The Taliban response is swift and brutal. So you're saying go now? Being hauled into a police station in repressive regimes like the Taliban's is never going to be anything but nerve-wracking. But this time, it seems we're lucky. I think, I think, I think they're a bit embarrassed about uh, being followed in by a load of men and cameras. Um, so we're just being told to leave now, rather than the whole embarrassment of having to deal with a foreign woman. That, though, is the image of what they want the women of Afghanistan to be wearing every day. This, this is all, this is all they want to, to see, and they don't even want that. The treatment of protesters here is the starkest form of the Taliban clampdown on women. But the impact of this strict interpretation of Sharia law is evident in everyday life. From the compulsory headscarves and all covering clothes, to the insistence that wives walk behind their husbands, Talking to women in the street is nigh on impossible, so my next visit is to one of the few people brave enough to speak out. We're on our way to the safe house where I first saw Brishna, the mother that I met up with again in Nottingham, and this is the place where she hid out before the fall of Kabul to the Taliban, and I'm going to be meeting one of the most remarkable women I have ever met. She's the woman who runs the safe house and who gave her sanctuary in the hour of need. Here on the outskirts of the city is the house run by Mabuba Siraj. 
السلام عليكم السلام عليكم It's a rare place of refuge from an increasingly brutal regime. These women and children have been here, some of them, for quite a long time. And they're all abused women and young girls of Afghanistan from different parts. Mabuba's sanctuary is long established and predates the takeover of the Taliban by many years. But over the past 12 months, the number seeking her help has reached an all-time high. When the evening meal's over, I sit with Mabuba for the first proper catch-up we've had in months. What do you think about things here now, a year on? Has anything changed? Has it got worse? Well, um... One thing that I, am, I know that is happening, we are becoming extinct in Afghanistan. Women, Taliban don't want the women to exist. I've really noticed that. They can't deal with us for some reason. Mm. That's why there is no schools. That's why there is no work. That's why the women are not supposed to be walking on the street. But just saying that, Mabuba, is a, it's a staggeringly depressing statement. To very, say. I mean, very. It is so depressing. Hmm. I cannot really tell you. I cannot count on anything. You know, one day everything is fine, and then the next day somebody can come in, and, as I said, shoot me. Hmm. Second, I said something and they didn't like it, and they're going to kill me. Hmm. Does that make you feel scared? No. Why not? How does that not make you I, feel scared? I don't know. I swear I don't know. I find it so ridiculous, I think. I find it so, so annoyingly childish, this whole thing. I find it so insulting. Everything else happens to me, but scared, no. That night, I leave the house with mixed feelings, a very real sense of anger at what's unfolding. But I'm also inspired by Mabuba. And it's her example that I cling on to as my journey back takes me deeper and darker into what's happening to the women of Afghanistan. It's been a year since the West pulled out of Afghanistan. And the Taliban are celebrating the anniversary of their victory. But while the men here are euphoric, millions of Afghan women have been left feeling abandoned and betrayed. It's Alex. Hi, Ron. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm not okay. I've managed to make contact with more of the women I'd met in the weeks leading up to the fall of Kabul. Sabir and her sister had been terrified when they first approached me. They explained that they were on the run from the Taliban because they'd worked for both the British and Americans in promoting women's rights. Who's that guy? Do you know his name? No, I do not. But in the end, all their efforts counted for nothing. Their pleas to flee the country went unanswered. They were left to fend for themselves. Now, a year later, I need to find out how they're coping under Taliban rule. Things are worse now. Getting worse every day. We were just sitting here and without any hope. How do they make you feel as a woman, as an Afghan woman? I'm feeling like I, I have done something really wrong because I am Afghan woman and I don't have any right to go out of my house. It's been months that I just want to get out of home. It takes days of planning, but eventually we finalize arrangements to meet up. Sabir, the woman on the phone, 
arrives with her sister Farida and cousin Amina at a secure location. None of these are the women's real names. For them, the journey across Kabul is a dangerous one, and they're clearly shaken by the risks. We were scared about that, and we are still scared that uh, if they find us or if they follow us with our documents, so maybe it will be our last day. You think they'd, they'd actually kill you? Yes, ma'am, they will kill us. They have no other way. They don't have any rules. They just uh, killed people. So there's no doubt that they will kill us. A year ago, the sisters were a high-flying lawyer and a human rights activist, helping women in their struggle for equality. But the arrival of the Taliban changed everything. How would you describe just how much you've lost and how much it's changed? Uh, actually, for me, it's a load of stress, a load of pressure, a load of sadness, everything, a mixture of feelings that uh, I can't even describe what's uh, happening with me. Her sister has also been silenced in the cruelest way imaginable. Farida was once one of Afghanistan's most celebrated painters, but no more. I uh, gone to my uh, small gallery, and the Taliban uh, took all of that and broke that. <laughs> and they banned my gallery and told us that you can't work on faces of women. How did you feel when they told you that? It was like killing me. Now we don't, we are not, nothing. We are empty. We don't have hopes. We don't have dreams. It's heartbreaking to sit and listen to women who only a year ago had so much to offer. Now their sole desire is to escape from the country whose future they once hoped to transform. Afghanistan has always been a male-dominated society, but the Taliban's extreme version of Sharia law means it's now even harder for women to be heard at every level. In this sprawling market, a woman is brave enough to protest about life under the Taliban. <laughs> She tells me she's lost her job and her children are starving, but a crowd of men quickly forms around her. The man who tried to stop us filming has called the authorities. Even though the threat of arrest is now very real, I'm more determined than ever to hear what these women have to say. Assalamu alaikum. Um, tell me, how, how much do you make per day? How much? Two dollars a day. Are you just selling this? What is it? A herb, a kind of herb. What can you do with it? Make soup? But the Taliban have caught up with us. <laughs> They can't stand me speaking to the women. What was he saying? What was he saying? He said it's not good for you, not safe. Okay. The mood in the market is hostile. Why should we be showing him anything? And the Taliban are monitoring our every move. Leaving seems like a good idea. Ever since I arrived back in Kabul, I've been trying to make contact with the group of women who organize the demonstrations against the oppression they suffer under the Taliban. Now, after days of careful negotiation, they've agreed to meet me. Hi, how 
Only a year ago, these highly educated women held positions of power and influence. They were lecturers, lawyers, lawmakers, part of a new generation of feminists forging a new future for Afghanistan. Now they're reduced to hiding in safe houses, taking huge risks to highlight their plight to the world. We organized our last big demonstration a few days ago. Why did you join the march? We were calling for freedom and food and work and also for the education of all women. How quickly did it become violent? After 30 minutes. <laughs> The Taliban came towards us and started firing in the air, in the ground. And we started running away. We ran anywhere we thought we could be safe. He shot on us. They shoot on us. They came looking for me and tried to take my mobile, but I wouldn't give it up. One of them hit me two, three times on my arm with their rifle and ordered me to delete all the pictures of the demonstration. Otherwise, he would shoot me. In reality, you could be raped, you could be tortured, beaten. We knew what we are getting into. We thought about every possible outcome. In order for us to gain something, sometimes we have to lose something. That's why we are the sacrifice, and we will remain the sacrifice. If I'm being completely honest, sometimes I find it quite difficult to maintain my composure when I'm listening to women who... I look at them and I see myself. They're, they're fellow females, they're fellow women. I see my daughter or my mother in them. I know they're being extraordinarily brave. I know that some of those women have stood in front of guns, men with guns who are itching to kill them. And I look at their little kids, their little girls, and think, I wonder what kind of future they've got. Well, at the moment, that future is really, really grim, really bleak. No education, no job, no rights. I think, I think if I was a man, I'd feel really ashamed. They should feel ashamed. Depressing. It's been a year now since the West abandoned Afghanistan. I've come back to find out how women cope under the brutal repression of the Taliban. So far, it's been unrelentingly bleak. But now I've come to a place that may offer at least a glimmer of hope for the future. Your sister's also training to be a doctor, so there's two, going to be two doctors. And do you feel safer in an all-woman environment? Yeah, actually, I feel safe than other youngsters nowadays. The students here are in the final stages of their studies at one of Kabul's leading women's universities. It's a Caesar, a Caesar of epistomy. There are currently no restrictions on women attending higher education in Afghanistan. And these students are the country's next generation of gynecologists and pediatricians. Uh, are you going to actually show us how to do it? Uh, 
we uh, should use epistemi uh, cat. I don't like the look of those scissors. For me, it's a pretty special moment. Here, everyone wants to be a doctor here. Everyone's passionate about being a doctor. It's the first time since I've arrived back in Afghanistan that I've been able to spend time with women who aren't being terrorized, traumatized, or silenced. It's incredibly inspiring, just even being in this room with all this talent and all these women who want to change the world, want to change Afghanistan. Doctors are usually really vocational, but because of the circumstances that they've been brought up in, because of the, the challenges that they've had to get to this point, it, it's pretty awe-inspiring, actually. But there is a problem. Universities may be open to women, but 80% of girls in Afghanistan are denied access to secondary education. And the students here are deeply concerned about what that means for the future of their country. Do you worry about the girls coming after you? Obviously, and what might happen to them? Obviously, a lot cannot study. Well, they have been there crying that why we didn't have this permission to study. You can study, but we cannot. If I was your younger sister, mm -hmm. and I saw my older sister going on and training to be a doctor, yes. and, and I wasn't allowed to, I'd feel a bit, a bit upset. A lot. I saw my cousin and I saw her because she's in class 12. She said, I'm near to you because I want to study in higher education. But now I cannot. I have restrictions a lot. So how can I do it? I said, I can't do something because it's not in our hand. We can't do. And if the ban continues, I'm worried I could be talking to some of the last women doctors to be fully educated in Afghanistan. And in a country where traditionally patients are treated by medics of the same sex, the implications are horrendous. What happens if we don't have female doctors? If we don't have female doctors, all women of Afghanistan will need to go to male doctors, which many people do not want, including me. I don't want my wife to go to male doctor. My wife doesn't want it. My mother didn't want it, and that's why she died. So we are playing with life. It beggars belief that the Taliban have chosen to deny so many women a role in the country's future. But that's precisely what's happening here. None of those girls want to do anything with their education apart from helping others, apart from helping fellow Afghans. It's like, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to encourage that? Who wouldn't want to tap into that? that that incredible energy and determination. But hidden away in houses in the back streets of Kabul, there's a growing network of courageous women who are refusing to be dictated to any longer. We're going to see a secret underground school because the girls are so determined they're not going to give up studying. This school is one of dozens that have sprung up in Kabul since the Taliban banned girls from secondary education. What's your dream for future? My uh, dream is a children doctor. Allah, I want to be a teacher. As you know, Afghanistan has not a good economy. Because of that, uh, I want to be an economist. Young volunteers teach core subjects like maths and English as they look to lay the foundations for a better tomorrow. It's really enlightening to see all of these young people who are determined they're going to learn whatever. It is staggering that they stand up knowing that they're doing something that the, the people in authority don't want them to do and say, I still want to be a doctor, I still want to be an engineer, I still want to be a, a teacher. I find the courage shown in this classroom by teachers and pupils alike is truly inspiring. But I know everyone here is taking an enormous risk in simply going to school. And I see how the relentless oppression these girls face every day is beginning to take its toll. Just wondering um, how scared you are coming to school. I am very scared of coming and studying at school because being a girl has really been outlawed here. 
How do you feel about that? Tell me how you feel about that. It's the worst feeling to see that girls in the rest of the world are free to study. Sometimes we just think of ourselves as criminals because that's how they treat us. Being a woman is very hard in Afghanistan. This is the reality for millions of women under the Taliban. A daily struggle against a regime that despises their freedom. But the refusal to be silenced extends beyond just the secret classrooms. Later on, we're shown a group of women determined to defy the Taliban's insistence that they serve men merely as wives and mothers. This workshop is run by one of Afghanistan's most formidable human rights activists. And what I witness here is a magical process of transformation. turn all these weapons of killing into something that's beautiful. Men kill each other with these bullets, but the women here turn them into jewelry and sell it so they can buy food for their family. These are works of art with a message, and that message is that we women want a world without fighting. Taking us to a different location, Layla shows us her team of dressmakers and seamstresses. Like the jewellery workshop, this is more than just a business providing employment and badly needed income. It also gives women the freedom to expose their appalling treatment in a male-dominated society. We designed this uh, dress and this hands. We use this hands because these are uh, the hands of a man. Mm -hmm. who touch a girl or woman mm -hmm. on the street. Tell me, how, how often do you get, do you feel harassed on the street yourself? It happens every day. And there's more to this dress than meets the eye. What looks to me like a traditional bridal gown is a not so thinly veiled attack on the men who are ruining their lives. This is one of the most amazing symbols of their passive resistance. It's a wedding dress um, to show their resistance to underage marriage, of which there's scores of in this country. And the sleeve is made of um, the clipped wings of birds, the most beautiful of them all, peacock. The, the frame of the whole wedding dress is made out of the colouring pens of, of school children. And the train, the trail, is devoted to butterflies, which are start off all vibrant and fragile and colorful. And then as they carry on being trapped in this marriage that they don't want, they lose everything. Their identity, the color, their voices. Pretty powerful, I think. There is as yet no organized political opposition to the Taliban dictatorship. But what I'm beginning to see here is a spirit of resistance from women who simply refuse to be silenced. And that cry for recognition needs to be heard far beyond the workshops and classrooms hidden away in the back streets of Kabul. It's been more than 12 months since the Taliban seized power here. After 20 years, the war is finally over, and an exhausted nation is grateful for the end of the fighting. But the country is now facing a serious social and economic crisis. Food supplies are drying up, and half the population is suffering chronic shortages. These women wait for hours for the leftovers to feed their hungry children. 
And there are increasing signs of desperation everywhere. For decades, Afghanistan has suffered from the scourge of heroin, but the economic collapse has seen an explosion in the number of addicts. There has always been a drug problem in Afghanistan, but I'm interested to know whether it's got any worse. Yeah, it used to be, uh, drug addicts used to be three million. I think now the population is about five or six million now. And it's not just in the city that the problems are multiplying. Across the country, a series of natural disasters is fueling an humanitarian crisis. This village in Kabul province has been destroyed by flooding. Those who lost their homes were desperate for outside support. But now that Afghanistan is a pariah state, nobody came. How hard was it to get help when all this happened? It was almost impossible. There was flood water everywhere, and we were cut off. Do you feel that the rest of the world has forgotten Afghanistan? You have had no outside help. You people are the first foreigners we have seen. Nobody came, and nobody cares about us anymore. The West used to spend billions on aid for Afghanistan, but that has trickled away to a fraction. These emergency rations are distributed to cope with the devastation of the floods, but they will do little to alleviate the now perpetual shortages. Can you tell me, what are you eating? How are you surviving? How are you getting by day to day? If we get the occasional help, then we can eat lunch. But if we eat lunch, then we don't have enough for the rest of the day. There is nothing to eat. But as always now in Afghanistan, whenever women try to speak for themselves, they're told to shut up. We're being told by the, the sort of tribal elders behind who are saying, can we stop filming the women, even though they're covered in burqas, so they're, they're not even allowed a voice to, to say that they're hungry. As they won't let me speak to the women, I turn to the group of youngsters, all boys, who've gathered around us. I want to find out what they make of this world where their mothers and their sisters are silenced. At the moment, a lot of girls can't go to high school. They haven't been allowed back to high school. What, what do you think about that? If they don't study, their future will be destroyed and they won't have anything to look forward to. How old are you? Twelve. Twelve. And what's your name? Mohammed Yunus. Mohammed Yunus. What do you want to be when you leave school, Mohammed? And what do you think your sister will be? They should also be a doctor because we have few doctors who are girls. But what do you think she will be, though? We hope that they open in school very soon. The stupidity of the Taliban's refusal to educate young women is obvious, even to a bunch of 12-year-old boys in a rural backwater. At each stop, Afghanistan's dire situation becomes clearer. This is Wadak Provincial Hospital, about three hours' drive from Kabul. Many of the women in this ward are very young. Some of them are child brides, forced to marry in their early teens. 20 years old, she has two older lady. Five children, 20 years old. Two? And uh, she had one miscarriage. She is two years old. Two? Yes. How two. much does she weigh? She is seven uh, kilogram, and uh, um, she should be 15 kilograms. Mm -hmm. So she's half of what she should weigh. Child hunger has reached a crisis point. She can't even cry. 
UNICEF estimates at least one million Afghan children will die of malnutrition this year. Everywhere I go now, I'm being told the same thing. Afghanistan needs women doctors. But the tragedy here is that the simplest solution is blocked by the Taliban. But like so many women here, Dr. Wardak is smart enough and brave enough to fight back. One of the problems is not enough female specialists. Yes. Even nowadays, we don't have uh, these uh, Taliban government, they don't allow us to uh, open the schools. Secretly, we have opened it. Our education is going. We will never, we will never listen to these uh, stupid talking about our life. Despite the danger, Dr. Wardak wants to show me the school she runs in defiance of the Taliban. Like the one in Kabul, it's hidden away for fear of retribution. The desire to learn burns as bright as ever, but these girls are going to need so much more. Tell me, what is your message to the outside world? For all the world, they uh, help us, we which are uh, remaining in this country. And uh, also, they pay attention for the future of Afghanistan. They take part in the education of the, our uh, next generations. We are responsible for, for them also. It's my message. The bravery and defiance of Dr. Wardak and all the other women and young girls I meet is incontestable and inspirational. But I leave Afghanistan knowing in my heart that if the rest of the world continues to ignore them, this is a battle for freedom that may well prove impossible to win. It's been a month since we left Afghanistan, and tonight I'm attending the opening of a special exhibition. These pictures are among the last remaining works of art done by Farida, the woman whose gallery was raided and destroyed by the Taliban. With Farida's permission, we took her pictures and smuggled them out of Afghanistan to show the world that she refuses to be silenced. It's really great seeing her work displayed here because every single picture is a depiction of torment and torture and anguish and represents the, all the betrayals and everything that the women of Afghanistan have gone through and are going through. This feels such a world away from everything in Afghanistan. There's a real worry that everything they're going through is going to be forgotten. They already are being forgotten. And that's a, that's a real worry to me. My return to Afghanistan has given me a terrifying glimpse, not just of the present, but also of the future. It's one which is entirely male-dominated, a violent and oppressive dictatorship, whose inevitable social and economic collapse is being accelerated by its never-ending war on women. If I had to force you to think of what generations unable to learn, what is the future for Afghanistan under those circumstances? A total, complete darkness. We are going to die, all of us. We will, we will disappear, maybe not die physically, maybe we will not die that way, but our souls will die. And the soul of this country will die. If Mabuba's prophecy is correct, and if we forget the women and girls of Afghanistan and allow that to happen, it is a neglect that will shame us, not just for now, 
but for generations to come. Thank you.